Hello students, and welcome to talking about the Great Depression in Canada. So let's talk about all the different pieces of the IB syllabus that this is going to go over. Um, in the Great Depression section, we actually talk about a lot of different topics, and we started by talking about the United States, which you may not have even realized was an IB topic. But in fact, the cause of the Great Depression, and then how good all the solutions to the Depression were, and critiques of those solutions to the Depression, that's all US stuff. But it also applies to Canada and Brazil, which we're going to be looking at later. We in particular focus on the impact on women, minorities, and African Americans, and its effect on arts and movies and literature. Um, but first we have to cover the actual nitty-gritty of how the Depression happened in Canada, and then also what the responses were. And then we can do some comparison and contrast with the United States. So the main causes of the Great Depression in Canada included this crisis in farming that occurred, uh, the inequality, the industrial overproduction, tariffs that Canada put up as a result of the Great Depression following in suit with what the United States did, the speculation beforehand, which was in the U.S. and in Canada, um, the stock market crash, which wasn't a direct cause but was connected, um, the fact that all the depositors panicked afterwards, the fact that businesses in response to these economic signals then shut down or held back uh, funds or fired workers, um, and then in the United States, Hoover was significantly inflexible in his approach to solving the Great Depression, and the Federal Reserve didn't manage the money policy right. So if those are all the ones that we are familiar with, we're going to look at how they are similar or change in the Canadian context. Because this is one of the most important questions in economic history, what caused the Great Depression, we study it a lot, and people have studied it a lot, which means that people argue about it a lot. So it's an excellent place to study how different historians take on this topic. For example, progressive historians blame inequality and a lack of consumption, that's a lack of demand, for all of the problems that followed in the Great Depression. Whereas more conservative historians blame the Federal Reserve and Roosevelt's overreaction for lengthening how long the Great Depression went, saying that it probably would have solved itself with some smaller additions uh, in the Federal Reserve having not gotten involved or having not made its mistakes. It would have solved the whole problem. Also, there's an orthodox view of the Great Depression. Um, Carl Daigler is uh, one of those historians. The idea that the uh, New Deal was this huge new revolutionary change for the United States. Um, whereas revisionist historians like Bart Bernstein uh, argue that the New Deal maintained the status quo by not really doing very much to change or reform the sort of capitalist mode of production, um, but they changed it just enough so that they wouldn't continue to have this horrific Great Depression thing, or at least that was the goal. So there's the orthodox view that, man, this was like infusing socialism and an intense change for how you know, American citizens saw government and all that. And then other historians who say like, well, but it didn't really change all that much stuff. And we don't have socialism such as it is in the United States. So how can we say that it really changed all that much? So with those areas of argument in mind, we're going to take a look at Canada because that will help shed some light by sort of stepping out of our own shoes as Americans and looking at some other place to see these uh, historians going round and round in argument. So let's look at how Canada is similar and different. First, let's begin with a map of Canada. Here you can see a map, and I like this because it's sort of justified uh, here, right? So uh, Greenland is set like this because we're looking at the top of a globe. And that's why it's curved like this. You can see the curved line between the United States and Canada going along um, one of the lines of latitude. So the main areas that you are probably familiar with when you think of Canada, you're probably thinking of like Ontario, Quebec, um, and honestly, probably Ontario because you think like Toronto. Um, but Canada extends into a huge territory in the north, just absolutely massive. And Quebec is a French-speaking area. Ontario and the rest of Canada um, has French and English speakers. Not to say there aren't English speakers in Quebec. Um, but at the time of the Great Depression, this area wasn't even all one unified country the way the United States was. It was actually a British colony run under British law. And so there was a lot of interesting conflict there about what the government at the sort of federal level, their upper level, could do, and what the provinces, their word for states, could do, and what that relationship with Great Britain was like during the Great Depression. 
So here's some key differences. Canada relied a whole bunch more on raw materials and then exporting them to other countries than the United States did. Um, their main ones were lumber and oil and metals. And Canada was also exporting a huge amount of wheat, which you'll remember the United States was too, and that overproduction was one of the weaknesses that farmers faced in the 1920s. Uh, and they overproduced a great deal of lumber, uh, which was feeding the newspaper boom in the United States and elsewhere in the 1910s and 1920s. So Canada's depression when it came was just as severe as it was in the United States, even though it hadn't started in Canada. Canada is an interesting case also for monetary policy because they did not have a central bank. So they had their own currency, it was separate from the British currency, but they didn't have their own central bank, so they didn't have a way to manage it uh, the same way the United States did. Not that that helped the United States all that much when the Federal Reserve wouldn't act on that. Um, but you see a similar thing right now with uh, with Europe, where they have a common currency, or uh, and the countries who are in that common currency, there's no uh, true central bank to manage it that has uh, the ability to do monetary policy and connect it with fiscal policy, and so the Eurozone has had a great deal of difficulty managing that. So this is one of those ways you can see that story continuing on into the current era. So Canada also, like I was mentioning earlier, they're in a parliamentary system, which does make it easier for smaller parties to exist and gain seats and gain traction. Um, so there's a little more churning in terms of the political parties. And also they were still a dominion, which is, I mean, it's not a colony exactly, but it's like, it's got to look like a colony. And uh, they were still under Great Britain during this time period and not fully unified. they are sections of the maritime provinces, which are those ones, uh, let me go back over here, the maritime provinces weren't even fully part of Canada, which I find fascinating. So being under this parliamentary system in British law, they um, have a switching back and forth of parties who are in power, similar to how the United States does. And so in the end, it doesn't end up being that much difference um, because they have liberal parties and conservative parties, but liberal and conservative means something different in Canada than the Democrats and Republicans meant in the United States because we have that interesting two-party system. So liberals, that means like classical liberal, like a person who's for, um, you know, open and free trade, uh, access to international markets, that sort of liberal sense, and conservative in the sense both of social conservative but also of um, conservative more uh, policies tied to the land and the sort of old order of Europe. So it's interesting the way Canada ends up this mix of the new and the old with the way their political system works. But they also have a huge number of small little parties that actually had pretty significant impacts uh, on the national level, but especially on the provincial level in the individual provinces. And some of these come up or at least are uh, born anew or gain a lot of power during this time period. There's the Cooperative Commonwealth Foundation, or New Democratic Party, which was the party uh, which had a great deal of support from labor, so people who worked in industries um, or who were Teamsters, people who uh, you know would join labor unions. There was the Progressive Party, who were similar to progressives in the United States in that they were um, you know mostly middle class, focused on reform of the system, and saw um, their way of going through the government and through the normal economic system as a way of solving all of the social ills and uh, economic ills they saw. Um, there was the fairly radical United Farmers of Alberta party, which is a, based on the sort of farmers, and that is somewhat similar to the populist party in the United States. And then Canada's really unique piece here is the uh, element of the um, their language differences. So there was the Bloc Populaire, the que Quebecois party. So the remember that Quebec has a great many French speakers because it was the main area of French settlement when France owned that area. But when the British took it, it sort of retained its French identity and has always been kind of um, like almost threatening to break away and then wanting its own independence, a little more independence, and then getting sort of pushed back. It's a, it's a fascinating dynamic to add that all of the leaders of Canada have had to juggle on top of the other problems. So one of the things that is uh, different about Canada is that they don't really have a, it's not a presidential system the same way ours is because it's the leader of a party that is in power is the person who ends up as the prime minister. And that's similar again to the British uh, parliamentary system. And so there's no term limit, which means you could lead a really long time if you were successful. But this is a very turbulent period, so we'll see some ups and downs for our leaders. Um, one of the interesting things about Quebec is that because of the you know, social differences, the cultural differences, the, the language differences, um, 
there's a pretty significant sense of independence in that province. And so they have different responses to the Great Depression, which is really interesting. Uh, Canada also didn't have a constitution until the 80s, which is fascinating. Instead, they had a British law, the British North America Act, that set up a legal system that's kind of like a constitution, but again, they are a dominion. They're part of a larger empire. This is our first prime minister we're going to talk about. He was the prime minister at the start of the Great Depression. His name is William Lyon Mackenzie King. And he's, I believe, the grandson of a guy who was a fascinating rebel leader, uh, rebel as in trying to help Canada break away from Great Britain and become independent, um, who was uh, unsuccessful, clearly, in his rebellion and was put down and fled to the United States. Uh, but his grandson ends up the prime minister of Canada in the 1900s. So he was the leader of the Liberal Party who came into power. And so in some ways he's similar to FDR, and in some ways he's different. He's kind of, he's a strange mix. Neither William uh, Lyon Mackenzie King or the guy who we're about to talk about comes after him is really like FDR, and neither of them is exactly like Hoover. So this comparison breaks down, but that makes it interesting to study. So pay close attention. Here are some similarities. Um, he did build a specific like liberal coalition with the progressives. So he saw those people wanting to reform the system as um, an asset to people he could work with so that his party doesn't fall apart and so they can maintain power. Um, he was leader during both the Great Depression and World War II. And he is a pretty successful politician. In fact, uh, sometimes considered to be Canada's most successful. 22 years he was in power. Um, but here's the thing. He really wasn't as radical as FDR. So yes, he built a coalition with progressives, but he didn't enact all of the reforms even his progressive partners wanted. Um, he was president when the Depression hit um, and never fully brought labor support into the party. So yes, the progressives, remember those are the middle class people, but then he didn't really get the um, labor parties into the liberal camp, whereas FDR actually had a fair amount of success in doing so. So, remember that key difference that he was in charge when it started? That always makes you look bad. So, King and his Liberal Party were blamed for the Depression at first. So he, while he was in power at the beginning, saw it in similar ways to how Hoover saw it, which is like, well, you know, this is normal. This is the beginning of a recession, sure, and that's, that's to be expected. And uh, we'll just sort of let it solve itself and do some minor changes just to make sure it doesn't get too bad. And, um, you know, we'll move on from there. But as it got worse and worse, he began to fall back on the excuse that the British North America Act limited how he could uh, act against the Depression. And in particular, he thought that that British North America Act said that it really should be the provinces who are in charge of managing this whole responding to the Depression process. And so, as you might imagine, he loses the next election. And Richard Bedford R.B. Bennett comes into power and is in charge for about five years. So in the 1930 election, um, one of the cool things about parliamentary systems is that when you're a leader and you begin to lose the support of your party or your party begins to lose power, um, you can call elections. So you can actually like say, we should have elections soon. Now... You can also do that as a way of sort of building support, showing that you have support. Um, and so it's in, it happens in parliamentary systems that you call elections and then lose. So King lost to Bennett. Um, Bennett was interesting because he came in claiming, like, I'm going to fix Canada, I'm going to have all these reforms. But he didn't have a lot of specific ones, uh, which is similar to Roosevelt. Um, and he even started, after a while of being in office, uh, calling his program the New Deal. So that will be confusing when you're comparing these two people. Uh, but unlike FDR, um, he did not, I mean, he was part of a conservative party. So he gets into power claiming that he's going to fix the Depression, but then he's a part of a conservative party. And so his beliefs get in the way of the sorts of reforms that FDR was going to follow. So Bennett sort of half-heartedly follows those things, but does things that are uh, more similar to what Hoover was attempting um, in his time in office to solve the Depression. So here's what Bennett did. Um, he increased tariffs, which, as you might know from me being worried about them all the time, um, tariffs make things worse at the start of an economic crisis, particularly as all other countries come back with their own tariffs. Uh, 
he provided funds for a public welfare system to the unemployed and destitute, right? Like sort of doing the minimum of just making sure people don't starve. And then he created a work camp program. Uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the United States is the closest parallel here. Uh, they called the people who are in these camps in Canada the Royal 20 Centers. Because remember, uh, 20 centers as in like 20 cents, money. And that's how much they are being paid, which is, as even back then, not much money. Royal, remember, because the queen is the queen. Or I guess that would be the king at this point. Probably the king. The king is the king of Canada, even though he's all the way over in Britain. Um, here's the key, though. The idea of the conservatives for doing this was not because they wanted to change the system overall, but because they recognized that if they didn't do it, they might have a whole you know Russian Revolution style thing on their hands, which they were genuinely worried about and should have been. Um, they implemented the Canadian Wheat Board, which was like the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, um, but actually more helpful to poor farmers because what it did was it bought up all of the wheat in Canada and then did it at a particular price and helped manage the, um, the then supply of wheat. It's really fascinating. So it's, it absolutely centralized that whole Canadian wheat production process. And it, I believe, still exists, which is bizarre and great and fascinating. Canada is a weird place. Um, the Bank of Canada created a central bank, right? They didn't have one at the start. It was a pretty significant problem. And so they created a central bank, which is a somewhat conservative policy. Um, they also made sure that farmers uh, had the ability to manage their debts, which wasn't even something that happened very effectively in the United States, I don't believe. But here's the thing. Those reforms didn't solve all of the problems, and in particular did not satisfy all of the calls for actual meaningful reform. And so as a result in 1935, King and his Liberal Party won a huge election. Um, actually, you know, won it pretty well, convincingly. He, in going into this election, King, promised much more significant changes, in particular ones that actually like would help manage the system as a whole, like minimum wages, consistent unemployment benefits. Uh, and he, <laughs> out of the other side of his mouth, said that the New Deal, that's Bennett's New Deal, not uh, FDR's, was too expensive. So he thought, what we need to do is implement all these incredible reforms. Also, Bennett's New Deal was too expensive because he was giving handouts and not reforming the system was sort of his approach. But it does end up coming off sounding a little bit um, as though King was of two minds. And then you see that in his time in office, too, uh, because instead of promoting um, m like lots of more reforms right when he got into power, he starts to kind of like pass all these things off to the courts because he saw that as a way of sort of saying, well, how about you speak on all these problems? And I'll just sort of stay over here until you decide that. And I'll, um, you know, bide my time. The U.S. Supreme, the Supreme Court of Canada, sorry, ruled most of the New Deal as unconstitutional. Um, and King did then, he had other reforms in mind, and they worked on those in the provinces and the national level. But ultimately, um, they entered World War II earlier, and their economy did recover faster, both before that, and then especially because, as you'll remember, World War II and all of the spending thereof really helps pick up your economy. But we're also going to talk about some social changes, right? Because uh, in the United States, uh, we had lots of uh, folk music rising up. There was the WPA, which paid artists and um, writers to create lots of cultural artifacts and take um, the stories of freed slaves. It was a fascinating time. So in Canada, hockey becomes important. The stereotype of Canada enjoying hockey is a stereotype and true. And it became the national pastime during the 1930s, not because everybody had a hockey team near them necessarily. In fact, the number of hockey teams went down, but radio became an accessible way to come together and listen to hockey. And it was a great escape from all of the unpleasantness of the Great Depression. And it was a way also of helping to manage the rivalry between English and French speaking regions and help sort of bridge that gap in a friendly way as opposed to actual revolution. So we're going to talk more about the uh, effects on women and minorities in class, but let's consider for a second some of these different perspectives on the historiography of Canada, the study of the study of history of Canada. The traditionalists would say the following. King and Bennett embraced far-reaching political and economic change in order to move the nation out of the Depression, and did so effectively. 
So like both of them in their own way did some pretty significant alterations to the way Canada functioned. And as a result, they got out of the depression faster than the United States. So the revisionists would come back and use a different set of uh, evidence entirely to show that uh, King and Bennett's reforms were actually very limited. And if you look at some examples that we're going to see in class, like the on to Ottawa trek um, and a number of other, you know, breaking up of strikes and um, not bringing in the labor movement, it was very much um, based on political repression and trying to make sure, uh, and also targeting of the communists and other um, socialist parties, that part of the way they maintained power was by using the sort of iron fist to stamp down on those groups, mixing my metaphors there. Uh, the conservative historians, on a third hand here, would say that King and Bennett's economic success in getting Canada out of the Depression um, shows that, in fact, that whole conservative approach to getting people out of the Depression is the best. So they're basically saying, hey, not only did they embrace some change to solve this problem, but their conservative style reforms did better than what happened in the United States. So that is Fascinating, because that's such a, a strange parallel story to what has happened in the United States. So you'll be able to compare not just what actually happened in Canada or didn't happen in Canada, but also how historians have talked about the Depression in Canada differently than how they talk about the Depression in the United States. So I'm going to have this slide up here at the end so you can check these out, because um, these are the sorts of questions that you should be ready to answer um, from your reading in the textbook from seeing that History of Canada video and from watching this video um, because you want to be able to take and use evidence from your detailed textbook stuff and from the sources that you read to answer more challenging in-depth questions like this. So take a second to look at them and I'll see you in the building.